Well, hello, Internet. Hi, my name is Coda. I am a decentralization enthusiast. I'm not famous. I'm not rich. I'm not a pundit. I'm not an influencer. I don't know if this video will ever be listened to by anybody, but I want to create it. Um, one thing about me that I want to put in the very beginning of this video to kind of um, speak to why I'm making it is I believe myself to be uh, a person who values integrity. So I'm responding to two recent videos that have been going around the internet. They're really popular. One of them is Line Goes Up by Dan Olson. And the other one is Let Me Explain Blockchain Gaming and Play to Earn by Christopher Natsumi or Natsum. I don't know. He probably said his name 12 times in the video, but these videos aren't particularly interesting to me. Um, they're mostly, as far as I'm concerned, just normal reactions to the level of hype and fraud that's out there right now. I honestly feel like the right thing to do would be to, to just ignore them. Um, they speak from a, a real place about real problems. Uh, they're also very emotionally charged and somewhat ill-informed. Uh, I feel like the authors don't see the, the forest through the trees. Haters are going to hate, and I probably shouldn't react. I should probably just move on and, and do my work and, and not think about it. But more and more lately um, on the social medias, my friends who are not particularly deep into the decentralization space, but are listening to me talk about my projects, uh, care about the space in terms of you know the fact that I'm their friend, um, and they're picking up whatever they can through the media and, and bringing these things to me. So of course, when these two videos went viral, these two videos were brought to me through private messages and posts and whatnot, and people saying, well, what do you think? How do you respond? And I really got tired of responding to these two videos, um, posting the same points kind of over and over again here and there, and basically feeling like uh, I'm in a place to defend the things that I believe in and then things that I care about enough to, to pour my energy into them. So the, all of this has prompted me to create this response. I apologize. I'm, I'm not nearly as excited as Christopher was. He was all worked up to a frenzy. I'm surprised there wasn't foam coming out of his mouth. And I'm not going to do the level of research that Dan Olson did. He actually did a good job of putting together a, a lot of information in his piece in a really good way. And I'm sorry, I am, I'm not a reporter. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to go into that depth. But I do have a story here that I want to share um, a story that I want to tell that I feel like is relevant. I feel like it's important and it's valuable. And with a little bit of luck, maybe the story in some form will get around and, and more people will know what it is that, that I feel like is, is so important. So I've got some notes here. I'm going to go through them, do the best I can. Maybe I'll just start spinning off and pontificating. We'll see how it goes. All right. Let's talk about the decentralized space right now, what it is. Um, notice that I keep using the, frame, uh, the term decentralized. I am not a fan of calling this space blockchain. Um, coming from a technical perspective as a developer, it's super awkward to call the whole thing blockchain. Um, I don't know, maybe it would be like calling the whole internet TCP IP. It just seems a little bit random and weird. It caught on. Um, I understand the cultural dynamics of how we got there, but I choose to stay away from certain terms that I feel like are less informative and more hype driven. And blockchain is, is one of those terms. So I frequently refer to the space as the decentralized space and decentralization. That is the component of it for which I care about. And this space is new. This is what's important. This space is new and it creates a lot of new paradigms. We're doing things in a way that they haven't been done before. And it requires forming mental models that most people would not naturally have because you haven't had an experience in life previously to create those mental models from. So there's a certain amount of time that it takes to grok the new paradigms and the impacts that those paradigms can have. And so we're in this phase right now that is all experimentation and all exploration. And it's super fun. Like this is why I'm here, right? Like 
this is great. We're, we're getting to try new things and explore. This is what interested me in computer science to begin with. This is what interests me in game development. Um, is this just this opportunity to do things and experience things that are right on the edge of, of what we've been able to do. So it's super fun, but it also, it, it comes with, well, it comes with consequences, right? Um, and these consequences, uh, they create uh, an opportunity for people like Dan Olson to do very thorough critiques of everything that's wrong in the space and have a lot of things to point to. Uh, the early internet was not entirely different from this, right? Like I frequently compare the early internet and um, the early decentralization scenes and, and as do a lot of people, it's, it's a frequent comparison that's made. And in the early internet days, we did a lot of really dumb things. Um, the lead up to the dot-com crash was uh, just a testament to like how many dumb things can we do until the whole thing falls down. So it's, it's no surprise that, that Dan has an opportunity to criticize the entire space very thoroughly because there's just so much low hanging fruit. It's, it's really easy to do. In fact, there's, there's nothing amazing about what he's done on that level. So in the early internet days, we had a different paradigm than we do in the early blockchain days. I like to compare the two. And a lot of people like to compare the two. And there's a lot to compare, but there are also distinct differences. And one of those differences is the fundamental and core message that I'm trying to get across in this, in this video. I know I'm going to be a little bit wordy about it. Um, I'm still learning how to tell this story in an effective way. This video is part of that process. Um, the story is important, right? So you've got the early internet days compared to the early decentralization days. In the early internet days, the machine that we built, the thing that we were able to do was to be able to transfer information between machines in a way that, that hasn't been done before. So it was about data, right? Like the important things that were changing during that time were, was how we manage data, transmit data, move data, share data. It, it was a very data-driven revolution. So with this early data-driven revolution, the, the people that were attracted to the new technology, the people who wanted to come in and do the exploring and the experimentation that, that I'm so excited about right now in, in decentralization. And I was excited about back in the early days of the internet, I was there experimenting with everybody else. Those people early on were largely geeks, nerds, academics, students, professors, scientists, people that had a natural reason to be attracted to the technology and want to use the technology. Um, academia, they may want to share information all around the globe. Um, scientists might want to move large data sets to contributors somewhere else. And these were the people that were playing and experimenting and they didn't just solve problems. They wrote games, they wrote utilities that they enjoyed, they shared them, there was sort of a, a community there. And for everybody out there who sees this video that was part of that community, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You were there too. And then there was some point at which those early days experienced a dramatic shift. Everybody knows about this dramatic shift. This is along about the time you see the rise of things like AOL and CompuServe. And, you know, people realize that other people want on the internet and there's money to be made here, but, but how do we do it? So the existing banking system was tied into the internet and we had e-commerce, right? With the advent of e-commerce on the internet, there was a dramatic, dramatic one-time paradigm shift. When commerce became part of the internet, we brought in the legal, I'm sorry, the legacy monetary system, which is bound to the legal system, right? Follow me here. So if you are a company, who decided to use this new internet to sell things and a hacker gets into your system and they steal money as that that company you, your reaction now is to go to the authorities and say somebody stole money and the legal system can now come in and deal with that problem perhaps they look for the logs they find out who it is they arrest them and if you go back and look in history you do have this period in the late 90s and early 2000s where the government was cracking down hard on hackers because they were hard to catch, um, but they were restricting commerce on the internet. Companies wanted to do commerce. 
They wanted the hackers dealt with. And this is when you have an era of hackers leaving the U.S. to go to Russia and other places. You have an era of hackers being disproportionately punished. Um, you have, you know, the death of Aaron Swartz, for example. Rough time, but the Internet suddenly became a very useful tool for doing commerce. And now we do an enormous amount of commerce on the Internet. To get there, we had to involve the law. And what the law is, is, is commonly described as a, as a monopoly on violence. Right. That, that's how the law works is the only people that are allowed to restrain you and do things to you, according to the law, are those who are enforcing the law when you break the law. It's a monopoly on violence. It's really weird, but it's what works. It got us here. So when this transition happened, when we introduced money to the Internet and e-commerce, the concept of what hackers were shifted. Previously, co hackers were just people who coexisted with the network. And if a hacker got into your system, there was a low chance of damage because there's no money involved, right? Hackers just curious. And anybody whose systems were exploited, they, the response that they had to do at the time was to secure their systems. The only way to prevent hackers was to be personally responsible for ensuring that your system is safe until commerce came on the internet. Now, if your stuff gets exploited, you also have the alternative of going to the law and saying, hey, my stuff got exploited. And if there is money or possessions at stake, the law can deal with the situation, likely get your money back and resolve the problem. And this is the counterpoint to what I call vultures, vultures being people who are looking to scam, people looking to hack, black hat hack for the intention of personal benefit, vultures. This is how we negated the problem of vultures on the early internet, sort of, right? If you think about the ecosystem of fighting this kind of predatory behavior today, uh, it, it's expensive. When people talk about the cost of Visa, and a lot of people who are comparing it to Bitcoin like to do so in terms of power usage, What's rarely talked about is the cost of fraud enforcement, the billions of dollars that are spent dealing with the massive volume of fraud that happens on credit cards because credit cards are they are not entirely secure. The system isn't designed to be foolproof. It's designed with an, the kind of incentives to make it secure enough that the gap can be made up with fraud prevention. And now we have a payment system that works all around the world. But these systems are still all held up by legal regulation law being enforced around the components that are money. I think I've probably talked about enough, this enough that you, that you can see where I'm going. So let's move on to the early days of the Bitcoin. Those were the early days of the internet and the dramatic shift that happened when commerce came online. Now let's look at early days of Bitcoin. There are so many similarities. And when I say Bitcoin, I say Bitcoin because Bitcoin was first. Bitcoin was the paradigm changing technology that hit. And sometimes I think about all the other derivative technologies as part of Bitcoin, but generally I refer to it as the decentralization space. So when I say early days of Bitcoin, I mean early days of whatever all of this is that I don't want to call blockchain. Some of them, some of the networks don't even use a blockchain. It's ridiculous. So in the early days, we have similarities in so much as we have that opportunity for experimentation again, where nobody knows what's going to work and what isn't going to work. And everybody's getting a lot of ideas. Um, some of the ideas are good. Most of the ideas are garbage. We're going to try those ideas. And some of those ideas are going to succeed. And some of those ideas are going to fail. But, but the solution to Bitcoin, part of what actually made the technology work for the first time was the introduction of the concept of value and money. We've had decentralized networks for a long time. When I was an undergrad in the 90s, uh, we had in the lab a decentralized network that we were playing with that was cool and did lots of things, but nobody was going to use that network because why would I dedicate my compute resources to running a network that's doing nothing for me at all? That I So if, if people aren't incentivized to run a node, no decentralization is actually happening. So what Bitcoin did is sort of did a chicken and egg trick where Bitcoin created money for which it uses to incentivize people to run the network. And the network is what actually maintains the money, chicken and egg. 
but it worked. It created the right incentive model so that people would want to run nodes because there would be value in running nodes. And by running lots of nodes, now you have a robust network upon which things can be done. And in terms of Bitcoin, those things that can be done were just transactions for Bitcoin, which is perfect, right? We need the first model of a decentralized network to be very stable, very robust. And by trying to do anything more than be what it is, Bitcoin risks not being those things. But because Bitcoin is money, which was required to make the paradigm work, right? For Bitcoin to work, Bitcoin had to be money. For decentralized networks to work, the first one had to be money because money is part of the incentive mechanisms that make decentralized networks work. You following? But because money was there from the beginning, Bitcoin naturally attracted vultures from the beginning. Those same vultures that came in and, and they started to make the internet a less pleasant place early on, uh, that spam, for example, email spam didn't exist, wasn't an issue until we brought commerce onto the internet. And now there was a monetary reason and incentive for spammers to spam. Well, in the Bitcoin universe, there's a monetary incentive there. People want to make that money. It's very attractive to people who want to create scams, vultures. It's unfortunate, but they were there during the beginning. But wait, it gets interesting. Bitcoin doesn't lean on any legal entities to help enforce or deal with those vultures. And this is a criticism that, that Bitcoin and things like it get a lot, is that this space has no protections in this way. That being secure is the responsibility of the user as it was in the early days of the internet. And people would argue, well, the internet's clearly better now. More people can use it safely. And, and this is true. But what made it better is the limited resource of legal enforcement. And legal enforcement only cares about dealing with certain issues. And in the Bitcoin space, where legal enforcement isn't an alternative, People have to do the same thing they had to do in the early days of the internet. They had to take personal responsibility for making sure that things were secure. That might be me as an end user, but it also might be a software engineer developing the project, right? If that software developer has the responsibility of ensuring that that software is secure and you can't go to the law, it creates a much more demanding requirements threshold. However, if the solutions are found that solve the problems that the law were previously trying to solve. If it prevents the vultures from harming the system, if it creates the security needed to prevent a black hat hacker from being able to wreak havoc, then those solutions are infinitely better than the legal ones. They don't require human resources. They don't have the risk of human failure involved, of the legal system making a mistake. They're intrinsic in the system. And, and these are fundamentally, right, the kind of problems that Bitcoin had to solve to exist. So the notion of solving these problems through technology and through incentive models is fundamental in the core thinking of a decentralist. These are core notions to how the technology works, right? So the kinds of minds that are building this technology are thinking about how do we ensure that this technology is used effectively, reliably, securely, and in ways that benefit humanity. So that integrity, that integrity is there at a base layer. That, that integrity is why I'm part of, of this whole I, I want to call it a movement. It, it's a movement. There's a lot here that is a protest, a political statement. It is a technology movement. It's political in a lot of ways. It's political in so much as you can be when you're working on a solution to a political problem rather than just making a bunch of videos and complaining about things. That, that was a
I was still in shape. All right, so where we're at right now, right? Bitcoin's been around for over a decade. The ecosystem is evolving, things are happening, but we have these things, these hype cycles. And these hype cycles are related to the fact that Bitcoin is money, there's money involved, money attracts a certain element. Um, more often these days, people complain about the VC element, which is just sort of a big example of, of one of those, you know, monetary monoliths out there that like to have influence on the world and try to become bigger. Um, they're getting into the space, they're funding projects, Dorsey's complaining that everything's owned by VCs. Uh, I'm none concerned about this, but because these entities are involved, these entities to promote their own products create a lot of hype, whether it's buying advertising or paying influencers. Influencers, that's another thing the internet gave us. Whatever it is they're doing to try to promote these products, maybe in the guise of building community, it, it creates a, a lot of hype that gets picked up by the media, gets turned into stories, and those stories go out to the masses. And this is how the masses understand what's happening in the space. The last hype cycle was in 2017. Um, it was really about IPOs and ERC-20 currencies and the realization that we could create tokens and everybody wanting to basically take that idea of creating tokens and exploit it to its maximum extent until you saw the collapse, you know, in 2018. And in 2022, we had another hype cycle, same way. Um, the same way people were just really tired of hearing about blockchain back in 2017. People are really tired of hearing about NFTs right now. Um, hype cycle looks like it's peaked. Markets may be going into some sort of crypto winter. It's great, right? Like now those of us who care about the technology can get back to building things and maybe everyone who's screaming across Twitter about mad gains will be a little bit quieter and get a little bit more out of the way if, if we're lucky. So why do I care? Why am I making this video? What is the point, right? Like clearly I wanted to tell that story I wanted to bring attention to the fact that within the decentralized space, there's a different way of solving problems that's important. And that what is perceived as, you know, the action of the vultures within the space does not represent the actual space. And the space is actually solving the problems. And the vultures are sort of like beta testers. They're coming in there and they're trying to exploit things and exploit people. And it's really unfortunate for the poor souls who get involved and get scammed, get rug pulled, whatever. But as this process is playing out, the overall ecosystem is improving and it's becoming better. People are confused and they think that the ecosystem belongs to and was built by the people who are doing these scams. It is not. The technology actually belongs to all of us. The way that the technology was introduced was through open source. All of us can participate. All of us can influence how this whole thing ends up being built out in the long run. So don't let those vultures come in there and decide that for us, right? I'm stepping up. I'm building something that I believe is built with integrity. I'm doing my part and it's important to me. So why do I care? Why am I making this video? Well, I'm making a decentralized game right now. I'm building an Ethereum virtual machine compatible application. I'm following the concepts of unstoppable code. It's a fully decentralized game that once it's released, doesn't require any centralized components to remain running. It's a thing of beauty and it's very important to me. I'm not building it to exploit anyone. Everything I'm building is built with integrity. I'm trying to follow the integrity that is the fundamental ethos of the decentralization community in building this product. I have outright been rejected by VCs when they have picked up on my idealism and my integrity. They could sense that I wasn't there to exploit mad profits and they were immediately, well, this is one particular case, immediately uninterested in talking to me any further because I had expressed how important integrity was to me. The vultures that are in this space, the people who don't have integrity, those that are looking to exploit, be it the VC, or the hacker or the scammer, every one of those people make it more difficult for me to create a reasonable product of integrity and get anyone to even know about it, to get anyone to hear about it. It's, it was better before the hype cycles 
Because if I told somebody about this thing I was working on, there was no preconceived notion of its integrity, value, etc. It was just an open conversation. Now, if I mention that I have NFTs in my game, a lot of people are just going to stop listening, despite the fact that I built the game first, not the NFTs. So because of these vultures, it's harder for me, which I can deal with because I know the vultures like beta testers are helping us to harden the system overall. But these, these videos of people bashing the space, right? Dan Olson and Christopher Natsumi or Nat, yeah, Chris and, and Dan, they make these rants online and they appeal to a lot of people. They appeal to all the people who are just sick and tired of hearing about all this hype driven nonsense. I get it, you know, I, I really hate that nonsense too. But these videos also summarize the entire scope of the space as being part of the problem, which rolls me into being part of the problem, which casts me as the vulture. And I've spent years of my life working on this project. I quit my job in March to go full time on this project. I barely have the funds to make this work. And if nobody cares because they just assume that it's a scam, everything I have done will be at a loss. And that kind of hurts a little bit. It's, uh, it's rough. It's very challenging. Um, I'm not going to stop. I'm going to do my best because I want to finish this. And I believe in overall what we're doing. And I believe that it's possible for me to find a place within this ecosystem to both contribute and make a difference, as well as create a sustainable life for myself. So please, when you make a video ranting about what you hate in this space, understand that there are hardworking people in this space trying to build things that they believe matter. And please try not to undercut us whenever you make your little video for YouTube and get all those hits and maybe even get all that ad revenue and contribute to that predatory system that exploits us for our data. Just take a moment and think about who your mad, angry rant might be hurting. This video probably won't get seen, but I've gotten to say what I want to say, and I appreciate the opportunity to do so, and I hope that a few people out there get a chance to hear it. Thanks.